transnational law allowed me to see international law from different perspectives, from post-colonial perspectives, from feminist uh, legal perspectives, and that I didn't really have the chance before. Um, for that, I think uh, transnational law was a good start for me. And um, for this, today's, today's uh, focus of my, my study uh, is mainly on international law, international laws of uh, seed, how uh, plant genetic resources are regulated mainly. This has um, many transnational aspects, but um, I, I wanted to start, start from a uh, main international legal framework to give the basis, and I don't really want to bother you with this uh, too much legal detail, but I want to give it overall uh, with, with the legal <coughs> framework. Should I? I just want to quickly check. Okay. So, um, the um, understanding and consequences of ownership on seeds have uh, changed drastically within the last century, and um, with that, farmers and traditional farming have lost their privilege, so to call, because for centuries we know farmers um, having their traditional knowledge producing our food and uh, suddenly, I say suddenly because it's very recently when we see the history of world, um, the genetics, science come in, come in and somehow ignores this centuries of um, knowledge, traditional knowledge of farmers. So this, far, this privilege on controlling the seeds and land races against multinational corporations, which are the intellectual property rights uh, holders now, um, kind of loses the balance. Because we have farmers on one side and breeders on the other side. When we, um, to start from the beginning, I just want to have this quick look at the seed systems in the world. So we have a um, formal seed system, uh, the one that I mentioned, I'm not really uh, an expert in science, but uh, genetics as we know with Mendel and um, breeding plants to create, for example, um, climate ready seeds and GMOs as we all know in our lives. Um, is is generally called formal seed system. So these are certified seed, uh, verified varieties. They, they give uh, the standardized, um, maybe um, tasteless tomatoes we have today in markets. But um, in, in ways it secures um, the majority of the world's food resources. And the informal seed system is basically the local system uh, that existed for centuries and um, kept on with exchange and barter and use among farmers and the, the stock of farmers. So it varies in quality, but um, to, my, to my understanding, informal seed system is what kept us alive so far. So. The research from Food and Agricultural Organization tells us uh, up to 80 to 90 percent of seeds uh, that farmers access today come from informal seed systems. Actually, although we have um, the the foundations of a global uh, informal seed system, we still have extra legal forms of um, seeds. Trans um, tr translated, used, and accessed through peasants and farmers all around the world. And this mainly comes from Global South as the richest um, continents in our world. Um, for, for example, Africa. And uh, we know that, I think I, I mentioned um, below, we know that most of the seeds, seven, almost 70% of, of the seeds in Africa uh, are based on informal seed system. But um, can we say today uh, that informal seed system uh, still feeds our world? That's the maybe question. 
uh, before we begin with the international legal framework, uh, I want to mention two basic notions. And um, on the one side, we have common heritage of humanity, which um, which is very old in notion that began began with perhaps Hugo Grotius, and um, when 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 discoverers finally reached the new world, they um, formalized uh, the legal foundations on how to own the property, the new land's property, maybe to do investment and to protect that investment, the common heritage of humanity notion began to be formed. And on the other side, we have permanent sovereignty over natural resources, which is actually um, established with the foundation of uh, the UN in 1945. Um, when the, the decolonization started and the new states began to develop their uh, sovereignty, this notion came into existence. Excuse me. Okay. This notion came into being. It, it basically refers to this struggle of um, political sovereignty of the decolonized world. And when they uh, gain their political sovereignty, they realize that it's not, it doesn't mean actually the economic sovereignty and, and the legal sovereignty. So the struggle uh, went on into 1970s when the new international economic order was established. And um, with this process, the long process, um, the third world um, began to actually focus on their development because at first when the principle of permanent sovereignty of natural resources discussed in the UN, the, the, ma major, ma the majority of the developed world focused on how to protect their existing investments in Africa, for example, or in their former colonies. So there wasn't really a time to um, focus on third world development, but uh, when it came to 1970s, this, this principle of permanent sovereignty of natural resources uh, became more and more important. So when we come to seeds, we have on one side states that are, um, of course, having the right to use, preserve and regulate the area of seeds, but on the other hand, we have the common heritage of humanity notion and the new struggle with climate change and um, protection of biological diversity. So we have this um, intrinsic imbalance and we see, we throughout this study, uh, I try to illustrate the, the, uh, the, the struggle to protect this balance somehow and we'll see it through the legal framework. <clears throat> so I start with the question, to what extent plant genetic resources, oh wait, so sorry, I forgot to. <clears throat> so to what extent plant genetic resources can be considered as a part of common heritage of humanity? That's the question. And when we look at the international legal framework, we see from 1983, the international undertaking of a food and agricultural organization. The main objective is explained here, and the um, notion of common heritage of mankind is accepted as a, as a main principle. But um, this is um, coming from actually UN, uh, first world made law and this is actually widely contested. And we see uh, farmers and peasants from third world arguing that this is not really con conservation. Maybe this is commod commodification, or maybe this is towards commercialization. And even if it's commercialization, scholars argue that we can actually try to protect uh, the biological diversity through uh, creating a market value um, that would create awareness, perhaps, that would um, make it more possible 
to protect environment. But um, then we come to this vital issue of traditional knowledge. How how would we um, put put a commercial value on, on traditional knowledge that that went on for centuries and now this the scientific notion of um, having productive agriculture doesn't actually recognize that um, very precious traditional knowledge of centuries. So the rebuttal argument here is that a major, major part of the traditional knowledge may not ever um, have commercial value, but, it, but it's still uh, something to consider. So, does international law um, recognize the role and importance of traditional knowledge? Uh, when we look at the Convention on Biological Diversity, we see that um, this is the first international treaty to recognize um, the role and importance of traditional knowledge. And this convention also recognizes the permanent so sovereignty over natural resources that I mentioned. And that, that's actually a big step coming from the uh, FAO undertaking, saying that uh, the resources are free to all, but that it's, but that it's not in reality. And the, po the most powerful uh, comes and extracts the natural resources. And the Convention on Biological Diver Diversity comes, more to, more, comes closer to reality by changing this notion to sharing in a fair and equitable way, rather than making this free to all as an utopia. So as we see, the problem begins when the seeds become a subject of um, trade, and the North, the global North, uh, as the main importer, and the global South as the main producer producer and exporter, the, the, the balance that I mentioned always needs to be considered and to be protected. So um, we see in the, in the convention that, uh, for example, transfer of technology is widely regulated in detail, but uh, when it comes to proper provisions regarding the compensation, because we see this um, extraction from south to north, but then the provider must be compensated and the convention lacks this part as to how to uh, compensate uh, for the origin of country. Overall, on the Convention of Biological Diversity, we can say that it creates a, a bilateral relation between the importer and exporter and it somehow uh, puts the third world countries in a better position by giving the, the chance to the local uh, to, to give the prior informed consent by through, through the national but still uh, considering the local and that cooperation is, is very uh, precious at this point. This is a very important convention uh, for biological diversity and although the majority of countries have ratified it we see that the U.S. hasn't still ratified it, and it's it's important, I think, because the the resource of um, intellectual property is is U.S. and the most profit made uh, con um, co companies are based on U.S. So the next convention I want to mention is the International Convention for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants. This uh, introduces the plant breeders' rights. Um, that means the plant, the plant variety is protected through science, to, through scientific knowledge, and that requires a special protection, different from intellectual property and uh, different from patent law protection, basically. A plant breeder is exempt from the basic patent protection they can, she, he, she or he can basically re do research in anything and uh, if, if a finding 
results with a new breed of plant. That means um, they can produce that plant and they can uh, sell that plant and uh, make profit of that plant. So that's a very important um, right um, as opposed to plant uh, as opposed to patent law because it um, in encourages innovation. And um, I already explained how patents are deferred from breeder's exemption. So UPOV, by introducing plant breeder's exemption, uh, puts farmers in a, in a rather challenging spot. Uh, farmers are still free to use their own uh, seeds uh, as natural resources, but that is very restricted to, uh, to non-commercial basis. They can only um, use their seeds for their own uh, farming, for their own small-scale production, and that actually uh, builds the, the foundation of the formal seed system to basically put farmers in a very limited place and commercialize the rest of the um, seed sector. A uh, very well-known scholar explains this as an indirect result of the convention, as, um, quote, the plant breeder's authorization is required only for production with commercial purposes, meaning that this authorization is not required for farmers to use their own seeds that's actually the initial ver version of the convention that is going to change uh, and the 1991 ver ver version that is uh, in use today uh, does not even give that scope so the farmer's uh, place is limited very limited today overall um, on UPOV we see that uh, the, the 1991 uh, revised version of the convention uh, puts farmers in a difficult spot. And it, it basically leaves no difference between patent law system and plant breeders protection. Because the circulation comes in full and while breeders can uh, innovate and find new plants and commercialize them, farmers can always produce for only their, themselves. So um, the scholars mainly argue that this UPO system prepares the grounds, have actually prepared, has prepared the grounds for the formal seed system. Um, as I will mention, Briefly after this, UPOV is um, UPOV wor works very well with the TRIPS agreement, and uh, especially with the TRIPS plus. And um, that uh, destroys the prior informed consent institution, and um, perhaps puts the the. Um, weakest countries in a hard position. So TRIPS agreement, uh, one of the last uh, international um, mechanisms that I want to mention, briefly just related to seeds, um, prompted by the US business community and it's based on the idea that uh, IP rights should um, be protected as, as, as foreign investment, basically. And that uh, forces countries that are members of the WTO to recognize and protect IP rights. And we will see, as we will see, through TRIPS Plus, plant breeders, plant variety protection always com uh, comes into the picture. And it basically functions just as patent law um, to protect the IP rights, including plant varieties. So uh, one of the scholars uh, mentioned TRIPS agreement as an 
a moral conception of patent law because it uh, mainly uh, focuses on the commercial aspects. And maybe, maybe this aspect is fine with uh, other industries, maybe technology and um, pharmaceuticals, and that's also a, a very uh, contested area. But uh, for, for, for plant genetic resources, it becomes ever more problematic. And expanding the IP regime uh, to reach the financial objectives as we see, it's, it's the main um, color of TRIPS agreement. And TRIPS Plus, so what, does, what TRIPS Plus does is um, it creates a direct bilateral agreement and forces the party of the contract to recognize uh, a, a convention such as international agreements such as UPO 1991. It's just, maybe just a simple condition, but then the, the country that, that is party to that um, agreement, mainly, for example, trips, one of the TRIPS Plus agreements, uh, has to change the majority of its seed laws. And that means the country wouldn't have its permanent sovereignty um, over, over its natural resources, mainly plant <coughs> resources, basically. So, the last one, I promise, I, I'm trying to make it uh, legal, but still uh, more talkative and, I don't know, less boring. <laughs> The International uh, Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture is also a very important treaty and that f only focuses on plant for food and feed uses. So it turns into uh, adaptation to climate change and conservation and protection and that happens uh, in two different ways, either protecting the plants in their origin, original uh, land, or carrying it somewhere in Switzerland in a seed bank or or U.S. to um, to protect it from extinction, basically. So, the this treaty, uh, although recognizes the nation's uh, sovereignty over over their resources, establishes a multilateral system and that means all the countries that are party to this to this treaty has to share uh, their diverse resources plant genetic resources and uh, has to make sure that it is accessible and um, this, art, this uh, treaty mainly prioritizes sustainable use and conservation of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. And that would happen through a multilateral mandatory system that uh, each member shares their knowledge and their plant genetic resources. So this brings another approach to the prior informed consent of the, of, of the provider because now we see that local has no voice in such platform. Nationals, when they become party of this treaty, they open up their whole system. For example, most of the African nations uh, went through this process and the most problematic part is through this system um, a third private company or even a non-party country can access this uh, oh, this um, data <coughs> basically and that is called biopiracy by farmer activists because uh, we have this huge data 
and we have this consensus on the basis of sharing this knowledge for, for, um, for fighting against, against climate change or to preserve our world, world's resources. But then this multilateral system becomes very problematic when the knowledge and data uh, reach the first world and then um, circulate it back in a form, in, in a patent, patented form. That means uh, the knowledge shared for the greater good would return, would, would have to be bought in, in somewhere in, in third world countries. So that is very problematic. I, I will, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I was actually talking about this. So scholars argue that um, this treaty, while um, enriching the protection mechanisms for the world, uh, puts the third world countries in a rather risky spot. So um, on the other side of my complex issue, I want to mention uh, how, how the globalized IP regime, how would that function, and why TRIPS agreement um, becomes risky for part, of the, for part of the world. So the steps projected to realize a global IP regime is these basic four, four steps. Um, harmonization is um, made through creating a, an international patent law in the beginning. We mentioned some of the main, most important con conventions and these conventions, as I mentioned, require in, in a later stage to change the national uh, regulations on seeds, basically. That's called harmonization and after trips we see um, many countries regulations resemble each other and um, that is through either uh, bilateral multilateral contracts or bilateral agreements so as I mentioned, TRIPS becomes a tool for standardization throughout the world and um, increases the strength of the WTO, especially uh, for control and dispute settlement. This one is the third stage of a global IP regime. So, um, I, I tried to explain the four stages with uh, the function of TRIPS. Now I, I want to continue with a little example um, as a reflection of, um, of the, the tool of a global IP regime enforcement and how it um, affects the national seed laws. So, the uh, example I want to take is the G8 New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. This is an example from Africa, and as we can see, there are 10 African countries that this um, alliance would be implemented. And the uh, G8 countries are from mainly the first world. It started in 2012 to be continued until 2022. And um, the new alliance program basically uh, ignores the informal seed system. Uh, it's basically uh, target. It basically targets the um, percentage of uh, informal seed system that is carried on in Africa, 
that is a huge sector actually. It's it's eighty percent of the seeds um, that is still used in use in Africa, and um, that is actually a big future profit for the multinational companies and the countries I mentioned, the G8, are very rich countries that can make this investment. The G8 alliance is basically planning uh, to change the seed laws because um, when they cannot control the extra legal forms of seed use, they can't create this new sector. They have to impose uh, the formal seed system in one way or another, and this alliance put the, puts the national governments um, in this, this challenging spot where they, they have to uh, change the seed, their seed regulations. That's one of the conditions of the uh, alliance program for the investments to be made. And, surprise, one of the conditions is to, sorry, I'm not using this microphone correct, <clears throat> is to um, recognize the UPOV agreement. That's just one condition, and that comes, that comes with the plant variety protection. Uh, this means plant breeders also will be protected as against to farmers that puts farmers even in a weaker position. Now that national uh, governments willing to take that investments in and plus the UPOV uh, implementations uh, in the national level could create more problems. So um, by this state most of, some of the countries, uh, they already, the national governments already pledged to eradicate the on-farm seed use. And that means eradication of the informal seed system eventually. And that is, that, that is the lifeblood of small-scale farmers, peasants. And most of the, the they can technically join in the investments as small holders, but it's it's very hard when we when we look at global food chains and these huge multinational corporations. Uh, for them to compete with these companies, they would need um, much more investment. I want to wrap up this part. So G8 um, example, I, I wanted to show this as an illustration of how the conventions are imposed through bilateral trade agreements. And uh, even though we, we say that nationals um, either become parties either ratify an agreement or don't. Uh, well, it's not how it works for third world countries, for the weakest countries, because um, governments usually just accept this for, for the investment. And then we see other conditions bringing the requirement to change the whole national seed, law, seed laws. So that's why I thought the G8 example would be a good, good one. So as I come to the end of my presentation, I just want to um, ask if, if, and there is no if actually, uh, we have this global IP regime that also covers plant genetic resources, sorry, and privatization of seeds, but, but then who would really benefit from this? Uh, and would this really be good for our biological diversity? Um, and the potential impacts on small-scale farmers is um, very frightening from 
from the examples I, I did research on. And the global concerns over agrobiodiversity. I mean, uh, the, the findings on climate change, uh, th they didn't get better after the climate ready seeds, after we have been using the climate ready seeds for, for a long time now. And um, that is, th there is no positive uh, outcome to pass on to a formal seed system so far through a global IP regime. And uh, plus the possible impacts on the least developed countries are um, very dramatic. <coughs> so, um, one of the scholars that are uh, actually proponents of a global IP regime argue that the most useful way to enjoy the products of the natural resources from the south without becoming dependent on those resources is through a strong global IP regime, meaning um, this, this regime could actually uh, make, it po make, make the extraction possible without becoming dependent because, the, uh, as I mentioned, ex situ protection and the seed banks in Global North um, could make this, make this possible. So um, how, how would we balance between formal and informal seed systems and between um, local and global? Because we, we are all enjoying the fruits of globalization, but we still need to protect the local, our local um, seeds for example. So I conclude um, by saying um, putting IP rights into work for conservation and protection of agrobiodiversity can actually exacerbate genetic erosion through standardized agriculture and um, the balance that I keep mentioning is already um, in danger. And extraction of plant genetic resources from resource-rich countries in the name of conservation and protection of the world's resources cannot be accepted as a mere incentive. And um, th there is as I mentioned, huge dangers for farmers' rights on access to even their own seeds. Someday they won't be able to use their extra-legal forms of trade on seeds or their own seed banks coming from their own uh, agri agriculture. So, um, I argue that the international seed law me mechanisms um, that I examined here, we see that law, isn't, even though it's objective and it's for the greater good, um, has ver various influ influence through politics and through economics, and that's the reality. And we can, we can also use this power on law for, for the collective access to seeds, and that means uh, fixing the imbalance, basically, between sovereignty over natural resources, between the self-determination of farmers and peasants, and the common heritage of humankind. And as a, as a first step, I argue that um, the imposition of uh, seed laws through international conventions, TRIPS, and TRIPS plus agreements um, should, must, must come to an end. But um, as, I, uh, as I try to uh, finish my PhD proposal, I, uh, I explored that um, 
the Declaration of uh, Rights of Peasants was adopted in October t t um, last year, and it is expected uh, to be adopted in 2018. This declaration also includes the rights to seeds, meaning, um, I wanted to quote this part, Very sorry. <clears throat> Uh, peasants and other people working in rural areas have the right to seize, including the right to protect to the protection of traditional knowledge. So the declaration recognizes the importance of tra traditional knowledge and the right to equitably participate in sharing the benefits arising from the utilization of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. Um, meaning, yes, if commercialization is a way to protect our biological diversity, then we must make sure fair and equitable share is still a possible option on the table. And the right to participate in the making of decisions on matters relating to the con conservation and sustainable use of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. Um, and the right to seeds in this declaration also covers the right to save, use, exchange and sell farm saved seed or propagating material. So in Africa uh, where um, the G8 alliance is um, in force, um, in some countries it's, it's even illegal to sell the self-used uh, seeds for farmers and uh, with this declaration, hopefully um, to be adopted in 2018, uh, farmers uh, could regain their rights to sell their own seeds. And yes, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Sesge. That was very, very interesting. Um, now we're at the questions and answers section. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask her. Hi. Um, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Sagar. Um, I've been involved in sort of a lot of the stuff that you've just spoken about for a good number of years. So, you know, you're, you're saying they're imposing all these impositions on us. Um, and then you've got the issue with the glyphosate, you've got the issue with the pesticides and the fertilizers. So even when you do have rights on the food, that food is being sprayed with something that was never being used before the 50s. Well, actually it was, but the only time it was used it was um, on Vietnam. That was Agent Orange, and then Agent Orange, people who developed that, developed glyphosate. I tell a lot of people that people don't put the two, two together. If they're going to use it to bomb a country, and then you want, you're okay with that being used on your food and your soil, and people are not bothered. But the thing here is, we know the stuff that is being sprayed on the soil, and the stuff that is going into the water. One thing I'm quite befuddled by is the stuff that we can't see what they're doing, which is the stuff in the sky. And a lot of people doubt this, and this is really impacting the sovereignty of the seed as well, because it reduces the quality of the nutrition or all the stuff in the soil. And this is going on across the world, all the way from Australia to the UK. So my question, and there, there's a lot of things to discuss, but my question is, is that while these impositions are being put on this seed sovereignty, where, whichever part of the world is in, mostly in the southern hemisphere, is there any recognition of the other impositions that are there, which are polluting the air or the soil, which then reduces the quality of that farmer's seed as well. When it reduces, the farmer thinks, oh God, okay, what do I do? Okay, this Monsanto's here, okay, I'll buy the seed from them because it's gonna be better quality. But my other stuff, you know, I'm breaking a sweat, I don't know what to do. But 10 years ago, it was fine. 
So I just wanted to ask Anand, the last thing is that, what is the reason why they are doing this? What is the, what is the bigger plan? You know, thank you. Well, um, yeah, I, th I, I thank you for the question. I think you, uh, you, what you're mentioning is a very vital part of our livelihood, livelihoods. Uh, but again, I think it's uh, beyond my research. Um, I mean, I would love to do more research on um, the international laws on how the air and water resources must be protected or um, how this is regulated. But I'm afraid it's, it's a bit uh, out of my research subject. Um, no, that's fine. In, in terms of... You know, you're, take, you're talking about how to protect the sea, just to point on that. I would just like to say that, you know, we have all the different communities and religions in London. One thing I've found is that, you know, you go to India, you've got Arabic medicine. You, you go to the Muslim countries, you've got Unani medicine. <coughs> you've got all these indigenous medicines. Whenever I see people in the UK, and I'm talking about food sovereignty, yeah. then what ends up happening is the people from these different respective religions or cultures, I tell them this is about your culture, They've ended up getting brainwashed in the Western medical scientific system, and then they denounce it. And I was like, what are you trying to tell me? You, you want to do climate change, so you're, you're indoctrined into the Western system, but you're still saying you're Muslim or Hindu or whatever. And in terms of seeds, the Southern Hemisphere, is, it was always rich in all these indigenous seeds, and in terms of solutions for climate change, there is seeds that can reverse all these problems. But the problem is that we've lost so much of our indigenous knowledge that yes. we just don't know how to go back. How many grandparents do we have to go back? Two, three, four. So my, my whole thing for saying this again is that after this uh, seminar today, what is, what is the outcome that you want? Um, because I go to a lot of these things. Is it that we need to collaborate and get other religions, well, I mean, not religions, but other communities together, actually saying, doing this in isolation, two hours later, so we get is, is the, I know, I know yours is just a research thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that obviously you want to see some sort of insight in it as well, some good insight. So is there is the insight to actually say, well, I've done my research, there may be some other people as well, to actually collaborate in some way? Thank you. Yes, um, I think that's, that, that spirit of activism is influencing international laws of seed and, and human rights especially on indigenous peoples and farmers and peasants and that actually began in the third world and um, in Latin America by La Via Campesina, maybe you heard, mm -hmm. farmers, activist farmers and indigenous peoples and this, uh, I think, this is what triggers international law mechanisms because law always follows um, social interactions, and that might someday um, help us be more aware of what we had as indigenous knowledge you mentioned, as traditional knowledge of of farmers that are being practiced mainly, I don't know, through centuries and. Um, I hope law can catch up as, an, as a beginner international lawyer. <laughs> Thank you very much for your comment. Any other questions, please? Um, it was very uh, illegal tonight. There were no concrete examples. I, I remember reading some time ago about a situation in, in India where uh, some traditional seeds or people were being uh, pursued or, or giving problems when traditional seeds were being used. Um, well, perhaps Monsanto or another organization had some sort of quarrel with that. Have I misunderstood it, or was it really as annoying and as, as uh, exploitative as that? Um, you mean the experience in India? It, it, was a, a, it happened to be an article which I read, which I thought, this, as, as presented in the article, it cannot be true. But uh, can you make any comments about some real examples where are really controversial? Yeah, well, well uh, while, while I was doing my research, I tried to pick up some uh, reports from NGOs and 
from people that have really worked in the field. So um, I'm not entirely based on the international law materials. So I, I think I can say from my very limited experience and research that um, these concerns are very, very much real and people, uh, the, the, the poorest uh, people suffer uh, through this mechanisms. And my, my research mainly focused on Africa, but um, the Indian experience, I am not really sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions, please? What is the position of the Commonwealth and in uh, as a possible structure of uh, a bulwark of change, <clears throat> the, uh, Brexit Britain, with the Commonwealth, if it were to itself adopt the, the, the right of the peasant in-house, as it were, um, is that a possible leverage point? I know there's a great many variables in there, but as a mechanism to drive change back towards, with things like, resources like Q, saying they're here, we can share these as well as Q. Is there, is that a possible, I don't, this is independent of what I know of what it is, but I know, does the Commonwealth take a position on this as the first part? Thank you. Um, I'm very, sorry. So your question is? Is there a possible structure to uh, reassert uh, uh, local rights through mm -hmm. the mechanism of the Commonwealth, which mm -hmm. can stand against the internationals uh, in selecting, th if it just the Commonwealth were to adopt itself the Declaration of the Rights of the Peasant, as this is what we're doing, and then having policy follow from that, is, mm -hmm. is that a possible way to think about to move change? I think that's a very interesting point of view. Um, Suppose there were a change of government here. Just <laughs> imagine. Uh, you know, that sort of idea. Mm -hmm. um, because you have Africa, you have, you know, it's a great deal of produce, food producing basket is there. Yeah. Um, can I ask a small question? How would um, Commonwealth administration how, how does it work for, um, for example, I don't well, it's, know, an, it's, it's an informal uh, a, a, a association it's, that is a way to hold together hmm. post-colonial. Yeah. But the question is, if, it, if that comes onto the platform there, yeah. and, and, and so that you have lead, lead being, political lead being taken against other, the, the many uh, agencies you talked about, Mm -hmm. Is it just a very practical mechanism we already have in, in existence that might be sympathetic to the, the, the thoughts you have brought forward? Yeah, yeah Rather than I agree. small groups here and there, you've actually got, we have a mechanism. Yes. Uh, before it's moving quickly. Mm. Yes, I think um, a, a, a first, I mean, a rich country's stance could be much, much stronger like a country, a country like UK, mm -hmm. for example, it wouldn't uh, jeopardize um, <coughs> its its citizens or um, the workers' rights for for an investment, for example. That would that would put put the country in a stronger position. Um, yeah. Thanks for your comment. <laughs> Any other questions, please? Thanks for your. Uh, you mentioned NGOs. You got some uh, data from NGOs. Yes. Right. Okay. I've recently been working with some NGOs in in Syria, war-torn area, yeah. trying to rebuild the communities, especially the farmers. Um, it, was, it was a project just uh, last year I got involved with. It uh, is about helping the farmers to go back to their livelihood, really. Yeah, to farm. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were given seeds, you know, not uh, alien to their local 
uh, soldiery. And so they start to complain that these seeds, in the long run, will actually destroy them, whatever the, the quality that these will produce. Yeah. And so are there any laws or checks and balances to, to govern the way the NGOs go about helping the communities like in Syria, farmers? Um. Yeah, they they can uh, be taken in the into consideration in the process of making um, the international agreements. For example, with the G8 alliance, even though uh, very very weak contribution, uh, some of the uh, women peasants peasant groups. Uh, gave their comments and their suggestions and um, I mean from the reports that I read uh, for Burkina Faso uh, if I'm not mistaken um, that were these um, suggestions were taken on board so that that could definitely be a process of making <coughs> making the law and um, the new declaration on peasants' rights, which is adopted by UN Human Rights Council, actually uh, takes this as, as a part of the right to be taken into consideration through the making of, of law, uh, to be an, an active, to, to be a real actor in the process. And that also includes the local actors, the NGOs, and um, indigenous peoples and women especially because peasants uh, in the third world uh, are most, I mean, the, the, the majority uh, working throughout their lives are, are women. So that, yes, there are possibilities of course to um, make them be an active part of the process um, from my very limited uh, research again. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, please? Can I ask a, a question of principle? Supposing somebody from some institute in the West goes to some other place and finds a naturally occurring variety of a plant, yes. which has never been used before. Mm -hmm. So the seeds are fresh to the world. Yeah. Can that person then patent those naturally occurring seeds, which, of which he's the only person that has any knowledge or experience? Of course. I mean, he hasn't derived the knowledge himself, he's just found an example which has never been used before. Well, d d well depending on the country that, uh, that this person is a citizen of, and the p depending on the national patent laws, but um, through um, international law, that, that plant would definitely find protection. And I think the first step would be um, applying through um, national patent regulation mechanisms. Uh, for my for my country, there there are institutions, basic steps that you take. But I um, I imagine there would there would be a scientific um, uh, basic um, test first. But but patent patent laws would definitely protect that that sort of. Discovery. A chance discovery can be patented, in fact. Oh, the chance discovery. By chance. If someone finds something by chance and thinks, oh, this is wonderful, I found it, I'll patent it. Does that make sense to you? Um, well, well, then the scientist who knows that plant would probably uh, gain that patent. <coughs> but I'm not very sure, though. I'm not a, uh, I'm not an expert in intellectual property, but. Does it sound like a sort of grey area to you? Yes, a little. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> I think the word we're looking for is sovereign. We talk about sovereignty over water, sovereignty over soil. We don't seem to realise that. You, me, and everyone in this room are also sovereign, right? And that means that no one can come into your house, 
ask the way through your door and do whatever they want because you have rights in the UK and other countries around the world. The problem is that we've all become so dumbed down for about 400 years by colonialism, so we ended up losing our dignity and our indigenous knowledge. And then it traveled to the Northern Hemisphere, where now everyone is subject to the same impositions, whatever color they are. The thing is that Christopher Columbus didn't find America, he just landed on the soil. Doesn't mean he can patent it. Even though the Americans ended up doing it for 400 years, everything is sovereign. The soil outside, the pavements outside, they're all sovereign, so no one can actually own or patent anything. Um, the only person who can actually own the soil or the plants is the person who gave it to us. And that was Mother Nature. She's the one that can destroy it, she's the one that can create it. But we can't actually, I can't put a patent and say, Sagar Sumaria owns this plant, which has been there for 50 million years. And it's been used by God knows how many people before me. Then that gets into the case of, well, natural capital. Do we put a value on natural capital, the forests in your country, wherever that is? No, you can't. Because then that gives it a meaning that I'm going to put a value of billion pounds in this forest. Well, yes, let's value it. No, because then I'm a company, comes along, I've got 50 billion pounds cash. I want to buy that forest. No. All these are Western constructs. It's a new form of colonialism. Smart agriculture sounds sexy and attractive, but actually it's just GM, Frankenstein's in another guise. We have to realize, and this is what's happening in India, it's happening in, look, which are the co two countries left in the world where they have sovereignty over their seeds? It's North Korea, and I think it's still Syria, right? I don't need to explain to everyone in here what's happened to the countries before them. There was about seven Muslim countries that had been completely demolished. They had seed sovereignty. Libya had seed sovereignty. Iraq, Afghanistan, a whole lot of other ones. But in Afghanistan, opium, right? Poppy. The, it's only grown for the purposes of delivering opium to the West. That's why Afghanistan, the British and Americans are there. It's just to eradicate and remove all the local indigenous seeds so, you, so the local people can live their life and replace it with narcotic from these plants which they corrupt for the western countries and the only people who benefit are the people who are invading all these countries. We have to realize the water and everything else is sovereign and this is something every single country around the world that people have to realize. But because people don't realize, then people think, okay, these people are coming to my country. Are you the question or are you the lecturing? No, yes. no, no. Well, this isn't a question. Good. This is relevant it's because we're all a threat here, right? My no, question. No, no, listen. You have to ask the question. Listen to me, please. Please, please. please. listen. Listen. If you've got a good challenge to what I'm saying, fine. My question is, right? My question here is that. This is something going on around the world. So my question is, what is beyond this discussion that you've done today, which is great, what needs to be done to get wherever the religions or the cultures or the communities together to actually come together and say this? We are only, a, this is only happening because we don't realize our sovereign rights, talking about sovereign seeds. This is very important, it's sir. It's not relevant to the subject we are talking Are you it's wanting to argue? Just, just to keep it short, Dan. Yes. Thank you. We agree with your question. Thank you. If you've got a challenge to this, then stand up and challenge me. Don't argue with me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. One final question. Okay, all right. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, and please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.